There's some really interesting differences in how the brain processes visual information and auditory information. So auditory information doesn't hang around. If I make a sound, it's gone. Whereas a lot of the visual information in your world actually stays there. It might move about a bit, but it doesn't go anywhere. And also, you only hear a sound because something happened. Sounds are transient and they come from objects happening and actions happening to those objects and, and then they're gone again. So, you know, a, if something in my world visually can be there as long as there's light, I'll know it's there. So you've got these differences. And another really interesting difference kind of links into the plasticity of how the brain deals with this information. So in the visual system, what you can find in, in lots of mammal brains are visual cells, single cells that care, for example, about lines which are at different orientations. So it's like a line at this orientation, but not that orientation. And what you don't find in the auditory system is anything that fixed. So you can sort of see in visual processing almost like a building up of features, lines, shapes, bits. You can kind of reconstruct your visual world based on these, these you know, basic features, like a palette of things to look for. And you don't find that in the auditory brain. In, or, in primate brains particularly, what you find is what's called heterogeneity in auditory responses. And that means that unlike a brain cell that might like lines at this orientation, but not at that orientation, what you find in auditory areas are brain areas that go, brain cells that go, well, I like sounds that have got amplitude variation, but I also like frequency variation, and I also like harmonic structure, and other things that might or might not be there. So instead of seeing brain areas that are looking for features, what you seem to see in auditory cortex are brain areas that look for, this right now might be important. This is an element of what I'm hearing that I might need to kind of process. So it's like a more um, general response. It will zoom into what happens to be relevant for the sounds that I'm currently processing, rather than waiting to see something. I, I like this kind of modulation and I won't respond until I get that. Now what that means might be because sounds are transient, you have to process them quickly, and they can be, for example, really affected by the environment that you're in. So my voice sounds different in this room than it would do if I was standing outside in noisy traffic. But it's also the case that if we look at some communication sounds, it turns out the kind of plasticity which you get from this kind of very heterogeneous response in the brain actually helps you deal with a signal that can be highly variable. And there's different sorts of ways that that's important in the human brain. And the first and most obvious one is we all talk differently. So you go out into the world and you might meet lots and lots of people who speak the same language as you and they're talking the same language as you, but they are almost incredibly unlikely to actually do so in the same way. People speak differently because of their regional accent, because of their mannerisms, because they have idiosyncrasies in their particular production. So, for example, my, my son goes to school in central London, near UCL, where I'm based, and there's a, there's a speech sound in English, um, there's a speech sound in like, or bike, the vowel that goes I, like, bike, right, and it's just going from London accents of English. Children say lack, back, rad, and when you first hear it you go wait what? And the next thing you're just processing it, you just deal with it. It happens all the time. So you need to be very plastic in your response to speech because you've got to be able to deal with somebody saying the word like, like lack or like or lack, all these different, different ways that people who speak the same language as you might actually produce it. So you've got this speaker to speaker variation and plasticity helps you deal with that, helps you just deal with the fact that there can be this huge variation out there in how people actually produce the same language, the same words technically can be said quite differently. The other situation where you find this is if you have problems with your hearing. So if you lose your hearing, get a hearing aid, or get fitted with a cochlear implant, what you might have to do is start to understand the language that you normally speak that now sounds completely different. So with a cochlear implant, instead of a voice that you're hearing now, you hear something that sounds a lot more like a harsh kind of whisper. And people learn to adapt to that incredibly quickly. And indeed, if they learn to adapt to this when they are children,
they can do amazing things with these cochlear implants. They can, they can hear music, they can hear all sorts of stuff that technically they probably shouldn't be able to do. So actually the plasticity that's built into the system both helps us deal with day-to-day -day variation, which is always there in encountering completely novel ways of saying the language that you're familiar with. And it can also help you if you have to deal with change, if you have to deal with a completely altered sounding input. There are really interesting questions around how this works in different countries because you do find countries that have got great varieties in regional accents and other countries like Australia where actually there's, there's just not much regional variation. There, there are other things that influence accents, so more or less ochre, which is sort of more like a, almost like a class distinction, posh, less posh, that influences accent. And that partly is a function of social factors. It's also partly a geographical factor. So in the UK, some regions of the UK that didn't have very much interaction with the rest of the UK have preserved quite specific accents, whereas other accents like the London accent has changed really quickly and continues to change really fast because it's continuously getting this variation of new populations coming in and altering it. So that even in the UK, this varies, and, and all countries are going to have different kinds of social and geographical factors that are intersecting with that. It's also the case that we just don't know what this does to your brain. We just don't know how this is actually implemented. I wouldn't be surprised if being able to cope with novel sounding people, even if there aren't accent differences, there will be individual differences that just aren't tied to location, they're idiosyncratic, they're specific to one person. If they're speaking the same language to you, you will tune into that. And I think it would be very interesting to know, know more about how this works across different languages because historically what's tended to happen is this largely gets studied if not in English, in Germanic languages. So there's even not much work in French in terms of the brain systems involved in decoding and coping with different voices. So I think it's one of the areas where we really need to take a step back and start doing more cross-cultural work at a brain level to start to get a sense for how different languages might be affected by this and the sort of social and economic and geographical stuff that feeds into the accent differences or lack of them. When you think about people talking, we can study it by understanding brains and thinking about brains, but we can never forget about the social dimension because it's always relevant and it's always important. And it is going to be influencing how the brain is processing that signal. So for example, there was some very nice work from Holland that played, they just played, they just played people's stories. And the stories had been modulated such that the sound shh and the sound kind of got mixed together. They didn't tell people, work out what's going on here. But what people did was they immediately adapted. They just listened to the story, but they adapted their perception of the difference between s and sh. And if you then took them and tested them to tell the difference between s and sh sounds, it had actually shifted, but only for that talker. So there's a human being behind. <laughs> the changes that their brain has made. They haven't remapped their whole phonetic system, they've just done it for that one person. So you can't really separate out the social aspects from those really kind of nitty gritty cognitive brain level changes. I suspect at its heart the plasticity that we see in the auditory system probably relates to the requirements of dealing with sound. Sound is strange, it can vary a lot, it can be completely, you know, if you're in a very, very noisy room and you're trying to make out what your friend is saying, you've got a very different kind of acoustic task there than if you are dealing with that same friend on the phone or talking to you in a quiet room. So the same task is made completely different by the acoustic environment that you're in. And because sounds go, you've got to deal with them very quickly. They don't hang around for you to inspect and pay more attention to. They've already gone. So I think the auditory system has to be really active and it has to be very plastic to deal with the demands placed upon it. It simply is different to visual information. Although, of course, some visual information has these characteristics too. As soon as you look at visual movement, you've got the same problem of things don't 
things are already gone. The, the movement has already gone by the time you want to, but you know, go back and think about it. So maybe we'll see similar properties if you look at the processing of dynamic information generally. Maybe it's not sound specific. Maybe it's to do with dynamics. But I think also the the, the variability of our acoustic world, and also of course the fact that it can go wrong. That does seem to be something which is quite an interesting property. The, the people's ability to cope with quite altered auditory inputs is quite interesting. In the field, one of the things we're very interested in is how we can best sort of understand this plasticity. So one of the things that we found is that the differences between people who can adapt very well to very different sounding speech and the people who adapt a lot less well wasn't associated with differences in auditory parts of the brain, it was to do with higher order parts of the brain that seemed to be I don't know, an influence backwards almost onto how the auditory system was, was engaging. And that was very interesting, but it does speak to a sort of tension. Are you looking at perceptual systems and their adaptation, and that might vary across people, or are we looking at higher order, maybe attentional or linguistic systems that are kind of guiding that? And there's a real tension there because some people feel very strongly it's got to be all driven up by a sort of a perceptual inwards process and that there's, there's not the sort of the scope for these top, even, even using the phrase top down can really enrage people. But it's also the case that we know, for example, that there are continuous loops of processing between cortex and subcortical fields that are really important in auditory processing. So actually, maybe it's not really meaningful to talk about bottom up and top down maybe everything we're seeing, even the bottom-up stuff, actually is reflecting this continuous looping of the processing of the auditory signal between cortex and the ascending auditory pathway, which does a huge amount of very complex processing on sound. So I think one of the things we're going to have to tackle is the inherent complexity of that and actually understanding some of these, they're called corticothalamic loops, that they're, they, it means that we can't just like draw an arrow going ear up to brain you're seeing these continuous looping even before you start to engage other brain areas influencing this. So it's ex we have to engage properly with the complexity, I think, and I think that's going to start telling us more about how this plasticity works and how, for example, it might vary across people.